You know, I'd be lying if I didn't admit that I got a bit choked up watching today's film because it just made me really sentimental for the early days of my podcast when I used to throw my gear in the wagon and go town to town and interview screenwriters and watch people kindly throw a few bits into my tin can. And uh, God, I miss those days. Howdy. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, and this is the Q&A. My agenda is simple. Each week, I plan to bring you in-depth insights into the creative process of storytelling. Folks, things have come a long way since those first days of podcasting with me out on the range. So, uh, you know, I'm just glad that the technology keeps improving. But look, I'm really excited for you to hear today's episode because we have co-writer and director Paul Greengrass with me for the Q&A. And, uh, you know, Paul was just nominated with Luke Davies for uh, the screenplay that they wrote for News of the World, which has received a WGA nomination, rightly so, because it's just a it's a great script. And uh, look, it was great to interview Paul. This is the this is the time in the pandemic where things work out a little because here we were, you know, he was in England. I was here in L.A. and we had a really good chat and it was it was cool to get into the nitty gritty about writing uh, News of the World, adapting it from the book, because they did a great adaptation. And look, you know, the only thing I feel guilty about is Paul's such a fantastic director as well that I did not, I was not able to ask as many directed questions as I would have liked. Um, but 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 maybe, maybe, maybe next time. But look, Paul was very forthcoming about his creative process and had a lot of great things to say about News of the World, so I know you'll dig this episode. And speaking of things to dig, I hope you mosey on over to Backstory.net to check out Backstory Magazine. You know, there's a lot to explore in issue 42, which is our new issue. I hope you'll check out our table of contents at the very least. And if you've never uh, read us before, you could test drive us. That's right. You could read the free issue over at Backstory.net. And remember, we could be read easily on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. Story. So I hope you check us out. And if you decide that you want to support us and throw your two bits into my tin can, you could uh, subscribe and become a subscriber and you could save $5 off a subscription by using discount code save five. That'll save you $5 off a one-year subscription, give you access to anything new that we uh, publish and also access to our archive. I would love to have my podcast listeners show their support and uh, subscribe to Backstory Magazine. So thanks for considering. And you know, if you want to watch these Q&As, if you're a podcast listener that's hearing this in iTunes or Spotify and you want to watch these Q&As, you could go on over to the Backstory Magazine YouTube page because that is where I put all the videos of these Q and A's right over there on the YouTube video page. So um, take a look there as well. If you're a YouTube listener and you ever want to go on a walk with our podcast, you don't want to stream YouTube on your phone, which you can, uh, you know, look for the Q and A with Jeff Goldsmith podcast and iTunes or Spotify. Now both groups know about each other. And now without any further ado, let's jump right into our interview with co-writer director, Paul Greengrass about his WGA nominated film news of the world. Paul, it's good to see you. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks. Good to see you. You're you're halfway around the world in the UK, so so we we've, we've we've got a a major uh, a gap going here for the news of this world. Darn it! Uh, so look, I I think it's always great to start with breaking in stories and give people a sense of who you are, where you come from. Did you did you study film uh, early on in your career? Uh, not formally, not as a student. No, I mean I went to college and. Uh, I studied literature, actually. Uh, and where'd you, where'd you go to school? Cambridge. Okay, yeah. great. Well, I mean that that obviously gives you storytelling roots, studying literature. Um, for sure, for sure. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah at what point did you, did you know that you wanted to be a filmmaker? I know that that part of your story is you know breaking in with the documentary show World in Action, which we'll talk about in a second. But when did you feel like you wanted to be a filmmaker? I think really goes back to school probably, you know, I I was, I didn't have the most distinguished school career, if I'm absolutely honest, it didn't really suit me very well. I've, I've never, I've never been particularly comfortable in institutions, you know, Uh, but I did love the art room at school that, that worked well for me because I could just do the things that I wanted to do and, you know, create things and make things. I liked that. And uh, and one day I found an old Bolex camera, a small Bolex camera in the back, one of the back rooms. It was like a dark room, actually, or had been a dark room. I think it was decommissioned or something. 
Anyway, I pestered the art teacher who was a remarkable man. Oh, you know, can you get me some film and da 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 da? And he did. And I made a little film with a friend of mine. Uh, and do you, do you remember what it was? I do. I do. I've still got it, actually. I found it about seven or eight years ago uh, in its tin. Uh, we made about three or four, actually. Um, yeah, it was like a little horror film, like a little Bunuel horror film and uh, with with dolls and Indian ink and scissors and, you know, it was the usual sort of adolescent. That, that sounds great. The process of it, I adored. I loved just time seemed to stand still, you know, and, and, and I became completely absorbed in the, you know, the writing a little script scenario and then a shooting plan and, you know, using little angle poise lights to try and get some dimension to the light and trying to work out how this thing worked and, and, you know, creating sort of crude animation things. And and it was just in unbelievably intoxicating. And I think for a kid like me who was probably pretty, tr- well, I was pretty troubled as a teenager and, and, uh, and I found it hard to fit in, you know, uh, it was all the, all the sort of anxieties sh- I had about fitting in and girls and you know what I mean and society sure. and, and school and just feeling so it was so it was a good like outlet for you. Fit, that all went away. Suddenly it was like this is it. This is the most exciting thing I've ever done. The thing where suddenly I don't feel anxious. I actually feel like I know what I'm doing. It was a very strange, almost out of body when I look back on it, almost an out of body experience, of course, until until the rushes came back. <laughs> That's funny. Then, of course, you see what every filmmaker has to confront, the difference between the things that you see in your mind as you make and shoot versus the things that you see when you're forced to confront what you've actually got, the, the, the pieces of images that you've actually got as opposed to, and, and the crushing sense of disappointment that every filmmaker feels when they confront their rushes. And then, of course, the journey, the long road out, which is every filmmaker's journey. Thankfully, if you're lucky with a great editor, as I've been lucky enough to work, somehow those ill-thought-out, unstructured images get to sort of make sense if you're lucky and your mistakes get thrown away and the things that kind of work get put in the right order and somewhere or other you end up with what, 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 what you call a film. And that journey I took when I was about 16, 17, and I think it... I never lost my my love for it, and I've never lost it to this day. It's what, what it's my passion. It's what I love to do. And you know, I'm sitting here today about to give, you know talk to you, but really, I've been spending the day sitting with figuring out my next film. When I was it going to be this or what? But it might look like that. And that's the it's a beautiful part of the process when one's done but you're not yet on the tram lines of the next one. You know, it's still yeah, that's great. And full of potential. That feeling is, you know, and I always check, I always check my passion levels. They said never seem to diminish. It's weird. That's, that's awesome. Well, you know, before we get to, to today's film, I just want to ask you a few more questions. I know that on <laughs> The documentary show World in Action, which was one of the ways that you broke in, you were profiling Bob Geldof for Live Aid. You yeah. also did an episode called U2 Anthem in the 80s. And oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a big U2 fan, and I'm just curious, what was your most surreal Bono moment or your favorite U2 moment uh, that fans would love to hear about while filming that? 
which I believe was 1985 well, or 87. Several. I first met them uh, in the run up to Live Aid because I made a, a World in Extra documentary. I was actually following Geldof around as, as they put the concert together and I met Bono at that point and interviewed him and then shot, I was one of the directors who shot the official documentary on the Saturday so I remember vividly that performance of Bad and when he jumped in the crowd, you know. Yeah. And I remember saying at the time, I'd love to make a documentary with you. This is a true story, by the way. It tells you the, it tells you the mark of you two as a band and those individuals. I didn't know them. I'd met them a few times, done that interview. I had nothing in common with them, you know. Anyway, I asked them. And then about some while later, I can't remember, maybe a year later or something, Paul McGuinness said, oh, why don't you come over? Or maybe I asked again, I can't remember. But anyway, it ended up, I was going to go to Dublin and they were they were writing and recording, I think, what became Joshua Tree. And I remember being in a studio and they played Streets With No Name and I was like listening to it before it had even been recorded or as it was being recorded and thinking, that's unbelievable, that's blinding. Anyway, uh, I was getting to the end of World of Nature. I wanted to go off and make films of my own, uh, you know, think, you know movie, movies, small movies, small British films. But I wanted to do one more and I wanted to make it about problems solved rather than problems posed, which a lot of documentaries tend to be about. You know, here's a here's a problem, here's a here's an injustice, here's a, you know, and that's what you cut your teeth with. And that's a wonderful calling and a great art form. I wanted to do one that was somewhat different to News of the World, but I had that feeling a little with News of the World. I wanted to make a film that was positive if I can put it that way. Sure. And, uh, and uh, they had done Joshua Tree and I s- went to see them. This is before they went and toured the album, but when I was, when they played Susan, and I said, can I make a documentary? I want to make it about Dublin, which was a city I knew well. I'd made lots of films in Ireland and Northern Ireland. It's the youngest demographic city at that time, anyway, in the mid eighties in Europe with tremendous problems, drugs, crime, but a great sense of vitality and possibility. And I said, I want to make a film about problems overcome and I want to make it about you too. And I want to make it when you come back uh, at the end of the tour, they were due to play two nights at Croke Park in Dublin, which would be the homecoming after this long, year-long tour in in uh, around the world, you know, basically with Joshua Tree. But but Joshua Tree catapulted them to a whole nother level. I mean, they were big before, but they were just simply enormous. So they said, oh, yeah, okay. So they went off and they toured Joshua Tree. They were on Time Magazine front cover. They, you know, they were just their whole right, life right. went nuts. A year later, I went to see them in, actually in Medina in Italy to hook up with them because they were due to come back to uh, Croke Park, I don't know, 10 days later, whatever it was. Sure. Well, I saw Paul McGuinness and he said, well, look, he said, there is a problem. And the problem is that since we went out of Joshua Tree, the whole thing's gone nuts. And uh, they had signed a deal to do what, be- what Rattle and Hum, basically, that big concert, right, movie, right. which was a huge multi-million dollar concert movie. I forget who made that film now, but it was very good, you know, and it was Warner Brothers, I fancy. You know, it was a big, big commercial deal. And I was a small British television company, you know, who was I? I said, yeah, it's it's difficult because I know we said, you know, we could do it, but the problem is we've committed now in the record company and blah, and blah, and blah. They said, well, come and talk to them anyway after the show. So I went and I talked to them. And I, and I said, look, I totally understand. You know, I just came out because, you know, we met. Blah, 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 blah. I remember Bono saying, no, no, I said, don't worry. We gave our word. We'll do it. Amazing. 
We'll it's find a way. We said we'll do it. We said we'd do it. We'll do it. It's amazing, and we did. And we shot it with a, about three, three or four cameras, as opposed to the four hundred and forty-four cameras that Ratman right. had. Uh, and it was that film. It was about. And I remember it as a joyful experience. And it wasn't really, it was a sort of concert film interwoven with, it was basically a whole group of people who came. It was as much about the audience as it was about you two. It was about people, you know, a mixed group of Catholics and Protestants who came down on a bus from the north. You know, people from the seminary came, young, uh, you know, trainee priests, in effect, you know. Yeah couple of kids who battled addiction problems, a couple of kids who lived in a tower block who wanted to be like you too and were like 15, you know. And it was it was about, in hard times, stories of young people overcoming their issues and all coming together at Croke Park for this amazing concert. That's so, that's awesome. I, I, I want to jump forward in time so we could get to today's film. The last question that I have for you about a previous film would be, you know, born was was a big jump for your career. You you had done a lot of television before. You had made feature films before. You hadn't dealt with special effects on that kind of level or action sequences. Big, big commercial movie, no. Yeah. What what would you say was your was your biggest lesson of jumping into the fire? That you know, if you could go back in time and give yourself some advice, something that you wished you knew going in that maybe you learned that inspired your creative process moving forward after Born? I was struck by how, in the end, it was both very different but but quite the same. In the end, whatever you're making and whatever size you're making it at, commercially or otherwise, budgetarily, it's in the end about a camera, sound recording, and some actors. Do you know what I mean? It's the same thing. The process, no matter how big, is actually quite intimate, you know? Yeah. And I thought it was going to be much more different in that sense than it was, but actually I was struck by how of that similarity. That said, there is a difference, and the difference is a little bit, I think, like flying a small, you know, a light plane as opposed to flying a 747. I remember the first day of shooting, we were shooting in, we started in Moscow, actually. And we had a lot of work to do in a very short period of time in Moscow. And we were location specific. We had to be out, you know, and uh, and we couldn't go back, which is a common problem you get. Sure. When you've got no money in your film, you know, you just got to sort of somehow get through it by hook or by crook and, you know, bits drop off, but you get there, you know. I remember vividly getting to the sort of middle of the afternoon, which is generally the moment when it gets brutal, when you've got to be out by seven or eight or whatever it is and you can't come back. It's like you can get this, but you can't get that. We could, can't do that, but we can do that shot. You know, that those are the choices you have to make and you have to make them fast and make the right ones. And all of a sudden... Uh, the guys were going, oh, no, we've actually got another camera and we've actually got a steady cam we can rig up and get that will go there. And we do, And suddenly what went from like two cameras to about eight, you know, and suddenly there were resources and I suddenly felt the power of a big movie when you're in trouble, you've got places to go that you just don't have uh, on a small film. And that's that feeling of being in a, I had imagined if you were in a 747, you whack on the power. There's a like a delay, and then suddenly you yeah, feel yeah, yeah. the thing roaring forward, you know, and that's what that felt like, and that is what big movies are. And that's why they're great fun, of course. I want to get to today's movie, uh, News of the World, and congrats because you have been WGA nominated along with Luke Davies, your co-writer, for, for your that's adaptation. Yep. And, uh, you know, I'm curious what struck you about – Paul, Paulette Giles's 2016 book, News of the World. When you read it, what was the promise that you saw that you thought well, would translate so well to film? Luke went first, you know, and Luke Davis did a great draft 
And Luke, I think, saw the same things that I saw, which were that it was a Western, that it was a two great characters in a great world trying to find a place to belong, you know. Um, and I think that I personally was in a state of mind having made the last film I made, 22 July, where I wanted to make a film that was about the road out of bitterness, the road out of division. What might that look like without it feeling sentimental, you know, uh, uh, not, not ducking the difficulty of the world that we're in today. Um, I didn't know it was going to be news of the world, but when I read the novel and when I read Luke's draft, I thought, well, this is it. This is, this is that journey. It, 1870 in the shadow of the Civil War, that's today. And, uh, and it was quite an easy decision for me, really. I thought, well, that's the story I've been waiting to tell, oddly. Not, not that I knew it would be a Western, not that I knew it would be an, uh, set in 1870, not that I knew it would be about a wandering newsreader. Just the sorts of feelings that I had about the world, which were about what is the way out of all of this. As a parent, that's what you think about. I read, I read, as I say, the novel on Luke Davis's draft, and I thought, well, this is it. This is the, this is, this is that story. And I'll tell that story with those characters, and it'll articulate and answer those questions for me. That's great. Well, you know, I want to talk about your creative habit for a second as a, as a screenwriter. When you sit down to write, how important is outlining to your process? Well, I think you have to, first of all, identify what it is you want to achieve in the broadest possible sense, which for me was to create an ending that was optimistic. That was the first thing for me. And then I... You know, I, I, as I say, I was working with Luke's excellent first draft. I, there were some differences of emphasis, you know what I mean? He, he did some, sure. some fantastic work. I suppose what I brought to it was more, perhaps more sense of the world. I wanted to put them in a more dangerous world, uh, I think. And, you know, you've got to answer questions about what, what the shape of it is. For me... I wanted to create a shape in the first act um, that was about kid reluctantly deciding to take her. In other words, the first act of News of the World really is about he finds the girl, uh, Johanna, but he has no intention of taking her home or what he thinks home is. He He's just going to take her to the nearest military command post. So I wanted to to try and create that first act more that way uh you know it was interesting it was interesting working with luke because we didn't sit together i had his draft and then he was off doing other things and i i did my pass on it and it was you know the film gods smiled on us because i think our different approaches met like a dovetail joint do you know what i mean and i think yeah. it worked well you know another question that i have for you about your creative process is when you sit down to write do you give yourself a page count to hit each day or do you like to spend a certain amount of hours each day writing yeah i'm pretty methodical um i don't set myself targets other than the target that i want to finish the piece of work by a certain date i'll do that you know i'll block out six weeks or whatever you know to do <laughs> I mean, we we had dates that we wanted to hit to shoot this, so I, I okay. was working into those dates. Um, but then it was about it's really the architecture, you know. That that's that's I I do approach the writing process in that sense, you know. So if Act One is going to be about ending with him realizing he's got to take her home, then I can backfill that's a whole act, you know. Then the second act really has got to be about them their relationship developing to the point at which they find each other, if I can call it that, that was really act two. And I said, you know, you sort of sketch that out on a piece of, you know, you think about it and right. walk the dog 20 times, and then you kind of get a sense of the overall. And then act three really has got to be once they've become a 
a pair of characters working together, if, as it were, by the end of Act Two. You really want them then to be tested in Act Three and driven apart again um, in order to bring them back together. So that was the sort of, once I'd got that structure, then it was about plotting the places that they had to go because it is a road movie in a sense. And so there is a sort of episodic structure to it. So that meant thinking about all the characters in the piece and I wanted them all to have a direct relationship to Kid. That was maybe one of the things that that I tried to bring. You know, Luke had worked on the, the sort of, the, the, the relationship between the two of them and getting that going, uh, particularly in the middle of the piece, I, I, I was sort of thinking and working a lot about, well, what are the relationships between Kid uh, uh, and all these characters going to be? You know, well, then, it, okay, well, that, that, that character obviously served with him, the character at the end, sure. with him. the bad guy in the middle, would have been on his side, but then became an opponent. So there were there were ways of making connections, you know. Um, and also, I'm a great believer that you can't solve all the problems all at once. You have to be methodical and work through, you know, do a pass on them, a pass on her, a pass on him, you know. And then you end up with certain core problems that are maybe more local, for instance, the end being a very good case in point. And we'll talk about that in the spoiler section, which we're going to get to in just a second. Um, you know what, just so we could get into it, what, what was your budget and schedule? That'll be our last non-spoiler question. Uh, the budget was just a hair under 50. And uh, the schedule, God, I can't remember, 12 weeks, something like that. Wow, that's great. Um, I mean, it was enough money, but there wasn't a lot, given yeah. that it was period and it was a western and there was a lot of that's lot of fantastic action, you know but yeah but, but you know we we thanks to greg goodman we 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 had what we needed you know and he and i have worked together numerous times and there's no finer friend a director could ever have than greg goodman believe me that's awesome. I'm going to jump into the spoiler section. So podcast listeners, if you have not yet seen News of the World, you know where to find it. It's been WGA nominated. Please go see it and help spread the word about it. You can find it in all the places that you're watching films online these days. But so now we're going to jump into the spoiler section. And please, you said one of the localized problems that you found early on by doing these character specific passes was some stuff about the ending. So the tell ending us is the big challenge, really. Yeah. You know, um, uh, the the novel is 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 quite a lot different. Right, His, novel, he has daughters to reconcile with. He has children. Exactly. And there's a long sort of twenty thirty pages where it deals with them after. It, know, it even deals that. with with Joanna being engaged by the end of the novel. Exactly. Exactly. So. And uh, and um, also crucially in the novel, he comes back for her. And she's been very badly treated, physically badly treated. You know, she's got scars and so forth. And the aunt, the uncle, have obviously been, you know, violent towards her, right? And abusive. And um, in Luke's draft, he went a little closer to that, not quite that far, but it was sort of down the the, the more faithful. Direction. You know, it did work. I say Luke did lots and lots of excellent work and that was what was great about the collaboration really they fitted together our work i think was complementary i then tried an ending which was different what i went for was um i thought okay well so, so he leaves her with the parents uh, sorry the aunt and the uncle i'm sorry and he goes back to san antonio and whatever happens whatever happens uh, and then when he comes back, she's gone. She's run away. And I then had her, him search for her um, in a bunch of cuts on the page. We're talking, this is before we show up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the idea being that he would get back to the aunt and uncle, you know, wanting to 
to collect her and she wouldn't be there. Uh, in the novel, he he goes back for her. She's been badly treated. And he basically takes her. He kidnaps her, essentially. I thought that was impossible to execute uh, uh, yeah. for two reasons, really. I didn't think it was right that the aunt and the uncle should be made to be evil. And also, notwithstanding whether they were evil or not, I thought it was untenable to have a middle-aged man kidnap a young child without the family's permission, whatever yeah. the circumstances. So that didn't seem to me tenable. So I then explored this other ending, which is him coming back for her, and she wasn't there. She'd run away, which I thought highly credible that she would do that. Yes. Yeah. And then he would search for and search for and search for until finally he would realise that he would never find her in sort of six cuts. And then he would give his last reading. And that last reading would be more of a bear your soul reading where he talked about the nature of his loneliness and what read, why readings were a solace to him and, and that all you could do really was bear the weight of what had happened and move on. And so quite bleak, really. And then he would come out of the reading and she would be there. That was basically the kind of thing. And superficially, that sort of worked on the page. I was quite good with that for quite a while, except that it nagged away at me that there was something, first of all, it felt, it felt down, not in a good way, and then all of a sudden they were reunited. And then the more I thought about it, the more I felt that it was manipulating the audience. In other words, it, it, if, if, if I understand a world where, say, at the end of Zhivago, Zhivago wants to be reunited with Lara, he sees her out the window of the thing and then he has a heart attack and dies and she wanders off. You know, she, that's life. You don't always find the thing that you want. Life is filled with missed opportunities and loss. That's just not, that actually in truth wasn't the film that I wanted to make, but I realized that that ending really, I, I wasn't having the courage of my convictions. If I wanted the end that said she ran away, he came back for her, but she wasn't there, that had to be the end that he would Interesting. search and search and search. And he would then give a reading to essentially discourse on why life was like that. It was cruel and unfair and you didn't always get what you wanted and have the courage of that ending. The problem with it was that that wasn't the ending I want. The whole explicit purpose for me of making the film was to find the light out of the darkness. So I realised that what I was actually doing was manipulating the audience and I didn't have the courage of the conviction. And, and if I wanted to earn the light, I had to earn it. And that's really brought me to the final iteration of the scene where he comes back for her and I suddenly realised that the impediment to him finding her was her. It, it was the moment in the story the the crucial moment where she had to choose she as an uh, it, for the first time in her life got to choose and that's why he says to her you know you belong with me if you want it's your choice and the aunt and the uncle are not evil they're set up to be yeah you know, somewhat joyless but not in a horrible way they're just they're trying to eke out a living. Right. And it's this wild child who's not theirs, who won't work and runs away. What are they supposed to do? You know, how, how's this going to work? And he comes back. And essentially the adults allow her to choose. She chooses her destiny and she chooses kid. And once I'd realized that about the story, that it needed Johanna 
to step up and make her choice in life, having confronted her demons, if you can put it that way. He's confronted his. He's decided what he wants. He's come all the way back for her. She has not yet chosen. She has to choose. She chooses. And then it unlocked the final reading to be what I wanted it to be, which was not about pain because he's we've seen him confront that. Right. But actually, to discuss resurrection, the possibilities of redemption, the and and to tell a a funny story, a, a heartwarming story, and to leave the the film in a right in, on a happy note and to enjoy their life together, which I, I think I don't is fantastic. For. I love that about the film. That's what I most wanted. So it was interesting. It went through that multiple scripting quite radical different options all of which were good in their way but i think the one we ended up with was the right one oh hey i'm jumping in really quick to remind you to check out backstory magazine you could do so over at backstory.net which you know you could read us over there on a desktop or laptop or via our ipad app Backstory. We're not on smartphones yet. Too media rich, too much good things going on. We have to build a smartphone app, but you can read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app Backstory. So that's got to be good enough for you kids. You know, we just published issue 42 recently. There's a lot of amazing stuff in there. I hope you check out our table of contents over at backstory.net so you could see what's inside. You know, a thing that I've been highlighting a lot lately is we have a section called Off the Shelf. We, we, we publish unproduced screenplays by writers of note in it, and uh, along with an interview with them. The, the two that we have in this issue are just awesome. You know, it's Simon Kinberg, the writer of X-Men Days of Future Past, and he shared with us Ghouls of New York, which was his first screenplay that he sold at the beginning of his career. He also did an interview with us about it, and we published the entire screenplay. It's about grave robbers in the 1890s, which is just such a fun subject. I hope that what does get made one day, I think it's worth it, and it's a really cool script. We also have Joe Carnahan. Um, he co-wrote a script with his brother, Matthew Michael Carnahan. It's called LA 57. I know in recent podcasts, I've been calling it LA 58 because I'm just a goof. Um, but no, it's it's LA 57. And uh, he's been working on it for 10 years. And uh, it's just a cool LA noir story. And uh, we published that entire screenplay in issue 42 and uh, along with an interview with Joe and Joe was also kind enough to share some concept art with us. So there's a lot of cool stuff in issue 42. We also, of course, have modern movies. We have retros. We have TV showrunners, comic book writers, all the good stuff that you would want. So I hope you check out what's in issue 42 and consider becoming a subscriber. If you've never read us before, you could obviously test drive us by reading the free issue in the Backstory app or at backstory.net. So I hope you do. And um, if you want to subscribe, you could save $5 off your subscription by using code word save five. That's save in the number five over at backstory.net. And uh, that will give you credentials that'll work at backstory.net, but also in the iPad app as well. So look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners consider supporting my passion project. So thanks for considering becoming a subscriber. And now without any further ado, you know, we're, we're putting this in the podcast. We're also putting it on YouTube on the Backstory Magazine YouTube page. So if you want to watch these things, they're, they're there now. That's something new that we started during the, the pandemic. But now without any further ado, let's jump right back into our interview with WGA nominated co-writer and director Paul Greengrass about his latest film, News of the World. I'll tell you something that I found really fascinating about the film because it's about new beginnings, getting a second start and really applies to where America is right now. He's, he was a Confederate soldier. Um, mm. He was on the wrong side of the war. They lost, you know, and mm. it's always been referred to ever since as the lost cause. And mm. there's two sets of people. There's people that want the union to be back together, to be these, these United States. And then there's people even after the war and sadly to this day that want a separate America that is not equal. And for me, one of the most fascinating moments in the movie, one of the, the sequence that I, that I really loved was when he was in the town with Boss Frawley and he realized these readings that he was doing could actually be weaponized. And it's because he realized he was in a town that was completely closed off from the world or what today we would refer to as being in a bubble. <laughs> and, you know, we we referred a lot to people being in their own distinct bubbles. And, mm -hmm. you know, these days we we talk about Fox News viewers in that fashion in which 
There's a lot of propaganda, a lot of misinformation that has been proven in court cases against Fox News. And their viewers have no other, they, they have chosen, they have chosen to not have any other outlets of, of media. And I think that's why we're in the trouble we're in. Tell us about that interesting sequence where he realizes rather than going with the agreed upon news of the day, that he inspires this crowd with news of, you know, an early version of unionization before it was called unionization of workers' rights. And, you know, these people... It's, it's probably the first time anyone has heard about being treated equally as a worker. And mm. it totally you know gets him in trouble with Boss Frawley. It puts his life at risk. He almost dies. But to me, well, it's the heart I, of the movie. I, yeah, I mean, I, I wanted his relationship to his readings to change. Uh, and they do, you know. Uh, and I also, and this was important to the sort of uh, construction of the screenplay was not to treat them as separate readings, but to think of the entire, that, that was one of the things that took me a while to sort of figure out was that rather than thinking of them as self-contained readings, I had to think of them. You had to think of them uh, as an audience as having experienced one reading through the film. So you'd open with the first reading and the last reading closes the show. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. and, and all the, and the second reading is local, you know, local news, then you get federal news. And and so that was important that you understood the structure and that the news became contentious through his journey, you know, local news that means one thing, but federal news, of course, is very unwelcome, or certainly would have been in in Texas at that time, because it's talking about change, and a lot of that change was contested and unwelcome. Um, and slowly, he has to defend his stories. That's what's happening with Farley. He's essentially offered the choice of substituting truth for lies and lies for truth. And in that moment, he refuses. That's what he does. He says, oh, I could read you this or I could read you something else that's going on that's going to animate your life and is going to be a powerful presence in the next 100 years of American history, you know, and, and by the way, that lies at the core of the American experience, which is togetherness and working together against, uh, you know, to solve a problem, in this case, a group of miners underground who are facing a fire, you know, and they work together to save themselves. And I thought that accentuated his calling, you know, at a time when, when facts were contested then as they are today, you know, so yeah. it made him a very contemporary figure to me. It, it was it was a great scene. You know, editing is the last stage of storytelling, and you could learn a lot about your story in editing. Tell us oh, about something that maybe you realized you needed to cut that you held on to as long as you could, because it's well, always I interesting was, to hear those lessons. Well, I was very lucky uh, that Billy Goldenberg, you know, who's a dear friend, and he cut my last film beautifully, and this one too. Editors are storytellers, it's the truth of it, and Billy certainly is. Um, I mean, his contribution was immense in, in so many ways, helping shape the story, helping me tell the story. Now, you know, it, I, but I think one of the things that was very important, oddly, we finished the film in, obviously, in, in lockdown, the post-production. I mean, we just started cutting when, when COVID hit. And I thought, this is going to be really difficult because we all had, we were all in the UK and then Billy had to come home and his team had to come home. And so we were suddenly dispersed around various different locations in America, various different locations in the UK. And we had to finish this film and we had to score it and do all the rest of it. It actually worked really, really well, thanks to the wonders of technology. Um, but the one thing that was tricky for me was that towards the end, 
I had no means of watching the film with an audience, even with six people or 10 people. No means actually when we were tightly locked down of watching it in a screening room. Yeah, that's interesting. And it can be deceptive. And I found that by then we were probably 10 minutes over what where, where we ended up. And so we were close enough to see that the film was working quite nicely. You know, you get a sense of whether you're in trouble or, you know, I always say you, your antennae should be all, you know, if I'm talking to film students, your antennae should be, are we in trouble? It's like, like, are we aviating? Are we flying? You know what I mean? As long as we're flying, yeah. we're okay. You know, yeah. are we in trouble? No, we're okay. I was I was happy and content that we were okay. The film was... So what was in trouble about those 10 minutes? It, I found it, because I felt we were fundamentally okay, I and because I couldn't watch the screen with people, and on a large screen, it became quite hard to make those last choices because you can some, because small changes can have big impacts when you're getting close to a film. Absolutely. You, you take three minutes out and you can destroy a film or you add three minutes and they're the right three minutes when you're down. It can make a film. It's, you know, it's the margins are small, but the effects are very, very large. So you, you get this, eerie sensation that you're car carrying your your expensive vase across the room and you feel like if I make a slip, I might break it, you know? And that was where Billy was really helpful. I mean, he was helpful in a million ways, but I remember those discussions at the end where he encouraged me to lose some pieces at the beginning and, and quicken up the beginning I'm talking about the very, very, like the first six minutes. We took probably three out of the first seven minutes, something like that, which is, that's a radical cut in the first seven minutes, but it really made it much more direct. We got to, we got to kids' character immediately. Uh, we didn't hang around too long in that reading. We got kid and we got into the woods where he finds the girl. So we got to the girl much quicker. And that's an important note, you know, because a lot of times really important note, yeah. in, in screenwriting, even like people say your first 10 pages are really important to engage the audience. So I'm not surprised to hear that you, you realized you could tighten and you could help the audience transition into your story faster. That's, that's a, that's a yeah. great note. Yeah, it was. And, and also in a, in an early version, he catches a glimpse of her when he leaves that first reading. Oh, Okay in the back of a wagon he doesn't speak to her he just catches a glimpse of her and then he sees her the next day in the woods and something about it wasn't quite right about point of view it just it needed to be direct right because it added deal familiarity kid, where there wasn't any you deal with kid and who he is he's the lonely newsreader and he moves from town to town then next thought and one day he goes into the woods, having left his town to the going to the next town. When he comes upon that was that was the, the, the effect of the change was to make it very just a little bit more well, quite a bit more simple in that first six or seven minutes. I, I I know we're running out of time. I mean, one of the things that I absolutely love about the movie, this is just inherent in the book. I just want to comment on is it's it's like a reverse version, inverse version of the Searchers. You know, in which the whole movie they're looking for the girl. This is the movie of okay, they find her right in the beginning, and the question is, what do you do with her? How do you rebuild the life? And it's just a great film about these two lost souls that that find community within each other. They find companionship within each other, exactly. And, and that's what I absolutely love about the movie. But as I know we're running out of time, I can't talk about that as much. I want to find out what was your toughest scene. What was your toughest scene, both as a writer? And how did you solve it creatively on the page? And also, of course, as a director, and I just want to comment, I know you're WGA nominated, but your direction here was absolutely beautiful, as was the cinematography of the film was utterly stunning. But but please, well, your, your toughest funny. scene on the page as a writer and your toughest scene as a director. I think they were both that last scene between the two of them, or the last scene where they're reunited. I think that was the toughest one, both... Both in both 
instances because it, you know, it goes back to what we were saying earlier. He, he, kid is coming back for, he's committed as a character on the page, right? You know, because he's galloping up, he gets on his horse, he's coming back for, you know that. And I love the sort of cinematic swell and, you know, there's sure. something movie-ish about it when he comes back and earned and I love it, you know, and it, it, it also reached back into the, the, you know, the, the sort of primal power of, of American cinema, narrative cinema and the Western. Yeah. You know? So I, I, I had no problems with him, but then it required this very committed character to meet characters and, and find a scent for what he wanted by asking for it. That was the key difficulty in the, the writing process was to structure very few lines, but to make sure that each one paid. So it became critical uh, that when he went to her, he said, I'm sorry, because he'd left her. And emotionally, she was angry with him because he'd left her. He'd betrayed her. They were a unit together, and he dropped her off at this place. He, she didn't know this aunt and uncle didn't know. You know, he just dropped her off and left. So it was important that he made amends for that and spoke to the truth of who he was, which is you belong with me, but that he said, you know, if you want, if that's what you want. He says, and what was hardest was to only give her the one line. So restraint on yeah. the page is the hardest thing to imagine. Uh, and, and then also the aunt and the uncle have, I think, only one line each. And it, they were very important lines because they had to, as I say, it said earlier, I didn't want them to be cruel. They had a point of view. They were honest people who were building America out of the sweat of their brows 20 hours a day, day in, day out, you know, day after day after day. And here's this child and she keeps running away and she won't work. That doesn't make them bad people. They may be joyless. There may be no room for stories in their sure. life. But how do you tell that? And 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 it was just the single lines, you know. Uh, she won't work, says the uncle. She no work. And because, of course, they're German. And the mother say, or the aunt says uh, she runs away. And you know everything in that. You know that they're helpless. They're not bad they're at, at a loss as to know what to do. Yeah, I and, think it also and, speaks volumes as a writer-director for you, in which you you knew what your actors would be capable of. So I think it is what you're talking about, restraint on the page leads to further emotion on the screen sometimes. Correct. And then it was about, you know, look, restraint in screenwriting is, by the way, I think the essence of, American cinema in many ways for me. I mean, you know, I can think of glorious, glittering dialogue, uh, it, it, you know, bejeweled movies that I love. Sure. But somewhere there's a sense always uh, in, um, in American cinema, I think, of, of, of cinematic words. Do you know, I can only call it that way. They're not literary words which you perhaps often find in 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 some British films. They're, they're, they're words that it's screenwriting. It's a yeah. different thing. You know what I mean? It's a just right. a, it's got and 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 where the one line can tell you everything. You know what I mean? And then you give the actor that one line and and you say to that group of actors anyway, because they all four of them were absolutely marvelous. You have very few lines here, but let's try and play this as if we've got all day to play this scene. You know, and that gave it an enormous weight so that every look 
played. And that's where Billy put it together so beautifully because he honoured the screenplay and he honoured the performances and he got all those moments right. Kid, having come into the scene so strongly, standing there then becoming very vulnerable, saying, if you want. Suppose she'd said, I don't want. Suppose she'd said, I'd rather. She looks out to the, you know, the wide yonder. No, actually, I'm going to make my own choice and take my own life elsewhere. You know, he suddenly becomes weak. The aunt and the uncle who've tied her up are suddenly weak. He's got a gun. He puts it down. And then you see in the looks the assent, the permission given. Right. And she rises up, this girl, and becomes the strong character that she's always been and chooses. And at that moment, then you can have the reunion and that's played suddenly. uh, I love that moment. You see that actually she, having been strong, she's a traumatized little girl and she wants to be protected and they get together. And that's just a beautiful moment. Right. And that's, and that's what's so amazing because you can't put that all into a screenplay. It's, it's direction and it's knowing that the actors can can play that. uh, Right. It's inherent. But, but you have to trust the screenplay. That's yeah. the essence of it. Trust that the screenplay has the film in it. That's what you have to do. And, and you're right. Until this, until you just said it, I actually hadn't considered the vulnerability for Captain Kidd's character in that moment because you're right. She could have said no. She could have been so upset by his betrayal um, of leaving her that she could have said no. And you're right. There, there is that there. They so all, each of those characters are strong and weak at various moments in that scene. And that's it's, the key to it, I think. Yeah, it's a good scene to focus on. Well, so I know we're running out of time. I'm, I'm a longtime fan of your political movies, Resurrected, Bloody Sunday, 22nd July. What are you considering doing next? What, what's on your plate? Is I it true that you know. might take on 1984? I think, well, we don't have the rights, so that's there's a big rights problem with that. That's so a problem. Probably, yeah, I mean, you know, I'd love to make it. I'd love to get the rights. I'd love to be the one who gets to try and make that. But we'll see. We'll see. It's okay. one of those ones we, we'll, we'll watch. Uh, so, you know, I don't, I don't know, but, you know, I'm, uh, I'll be uh, – I'll be back out there soon. That's for sure. Okay. Well, look, congrats again on your WGA nomination with Luke. It was very well earned. I love the screenplay for this movie and I cannot wait to see what you do next. Thanks for being so generous with your time. Thanks a lot. See you later. And that's how the Q&A went down. Special thanks again to co-writer and director Paul Greengrass for being so generous with his time about his latest film, News of the World, which is WGA nominated. So I hope you spread the word about it because uh, because Paul did a fantastic job in his adaptation. And, uh, you know, it was great to have him. So thanks again to Paul for making this episode happen. Of course, while you're surfing around online, I will say it in cowboy terms. I hope you mosey on over to Backstory.net to check out the latest issue of Backstory Magazine. You know, you can read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. And there's so much to explore. We we recently published issue 42. You can look at the table of contents there. Of course, if you've never read us before, you could test drive us by reading our free issue in the Backstory app or at backstory.net. And if you decide that you want to subscribe, you could use discount code SAVE5. That's SAVE in the number five over at backstory.net when you check out. And that will save you $5 off a one-year subscription. It'll give you access to anything new we publish and our archive, which goes back around to issue 29. And I'm going to be adding more issues to it, but it's just hard to do that as we keep publishing new stuff. And we're already working on issue 43. So life's crazy, kids, but it the archive is going to keep expanding and go back into the past. But look, it would mean so much to me to have my podcast listeners and now YouTube watchers of Backstory Magazine's YouTube account consider supporting my passion project. So thanks for considering becoming a subscriber. The Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith podcast is a copyright of Unlikely Films Incorporated in 2021. All rights reserved. You know, folks, if you ever want to reach out to me, you could reach me at yogoldsmith at gmail.com. I promise to not get back to you immediately. I say that every week. It's true. Uh, I will do better, but uh, you could always email me there. You could find me on Twitter as yogoldsmith. 
You can find me on Twitter running the backstory underscore mag account for the magazine. You can find me on Instagram in that same, those same two titles, uh, Yo Goldsmith on Instagram or backstory underscore mag on Instagram. And yes, I have a Facebook fan page and I'm going to try and use it a little more. Um, but uh, that would be the other way to reach out to me. So I'm an easy guy to find kids. If you want to write in, tell me what you like, what you don't like, feel free to send all of your comments right to me anytime you want. I'm Jeff Goldsmith. I'm the publisher of Backstory Magazine and the host of the Q&A, thanking you for tuning in and telling you to stay out of trouble till next week.